Uh, today we're going to talk about recovering the crown, which is critical. Recovering the crown. You know, people don't understand uh, what or how this context of this book really fits into our world because it's, it's strange to us because it's very familiar, very connected to the Old Testament, which makes it more difficult for us New Testament believers to really understand without a full working knowledge of the Old Testament. We are not like the Jewish recipients that grew up studying and learning and memorizing the law. You know, they, they grew up knowing their Bible, which was their Old Testament. And so for us, when we see quotes and we see exchanges, it's, it's more difficult for us to grasp. Now, the author, you know, stopped for a minute uh, and gave his first warning. Now, I, I've told you there are five what we call progressive warnings in the book of Hebrews. The first one started in chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 3, and they're progressive. It, it goes from drifting to defying God all the way to Hebrews chapter 12. So right here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the first warning we looked at was therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So he starts off in chapter 2, we have to pay, not only pay attention, but we must pay much closer attention. Uh, I told you the Greek word meant to have intentionality, that it actually created action, not just seeing something, but seeing it, and because you see it, it moves you to action. So we need to pay attention to what we've heard, the truth about who Jesus is, who God is, and how that relates to us, the gospel. We should be preaching the gospel to ourselves daily. Why? So that we do not drift away, so that we do not fall away. You know, it's real easy to drift, and the author is warning us not to drift, because if we drift, we will neglect our great salvation, which is verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Well, when you begin to drift, you start to neglect. You know, people that have been married for a long time, they begin to neglect their spouse. They neglect their yard. They neglect their job. When you start neglecting stuff, you start neglecting it because you're not paying attention. If you stop paying attention to something, you will neglect it. And if you neglect it, you will drift. The results here is if you neglect your salvation, what God has done for you and what God is doing in you and what God wants to do through you, you will drift. And it's not healthy for us. So this is the first warning. So the writer now returns to his discussion about angels, right? He started chapter 1 teaching that Jesus is superior to the angels, that he is superior to everyone everywhere. And he starts with the angels because in the Jewish mind, angels were elevated. They were ultimate. There were sects of Jews that believed that Michael, the archangel, you can see this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, believed that he would one day rule over the earth. But that is anti-biblical. That's not the truth. So the author continues, after the warning, his argument about Christ being superior to the angels. Now, you have to understand, man today is lost. I mean, totally lost lost and losing his right relationship to God he also lost his meaning for existence that's right man lost his meaning for existence and these verses here teach us God's intended destiny for man what we're supposed to be how we lost it and how we can regain regain it through the a savior through what Jesus did for us so let's start with God's ultimate agenda all right this is what the author wants us to know. So I'm going to give you the text for the message today, which is Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8, actually the first part of 8. It says, for it, was, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man, that you are mindful of him, or the Son of Man, that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So the author here in verse 5 starts by revealing God's plan for man. He says, for it was not the angels that God subjected the world to come. Not just our current world, 
but the world to come. All right, there will be a new earth and a new day. And God did not choose the angels to rule over that new earth in that new day. Now, this is critical for us to understand because the angels now and in our present world have some rulership. They have some leadership. And the statement here by the author of Hebrews, the writer, forcefully refutes this view. The Jews believe that that these angels had this hierarchy and that they would one day rule the earth and we were just submitted to them, that for the rest of eternity that we would be in submission to the angels. But he refused this by saying not angels, but people. People will be awarded the dominion in the world to come, that we will rule in the world and angels will be our ministers to those who are heirs of salvation. In the world to come, angels will be our servants. Hear me. Angels will be our servants, not rulers, but servants. The word here, subject, in verse 5, the Greek word is hupostao, all right? It's a military term primarily used to arrange soldiers in order according to rank. It's also a term that was used for systems of administration. So when you had systems of administration, you have to have a hierarchy. God will not turn over the administration of the world to come to angels. He won't. And there is going to be a new world. It will be great and glorious. And those who rule in that world, it will be a world of perfection. And whoever reigns in that world will be glorious indeed. And I want you to know that you will rule in that world. If you are a co-heir with Christ, you will rule in the world to come. This present superiority that angels have over us is temporary. It's not eternal. It's temporary. The Greek word here for world, right, in verse 5, is not the general term cosmos, which means the systems. It's not the general word that you see throughout the New Testament, cosmos, for the word world. It's not the Greek word ion, which is the ages. But it's a very specific Greek word, oikemene. And what it means is the inhabited earth. We will rule over the inhabited earth. Think about that. You will be a king. And you will rule over the inhabited earth. And that's mind-blowing. To think that God would choose you blows my mind to think that God would choose me, that we would be rulers in the world to come. Now, this is a problem, or it's problematic to those who are amillennialists, all right? And, I'm, you know, there, there are different doctrines for what we call eschatology, right? So most Reformed people are amillennialists, and so this becomes a problem for them because they maintain that there is no future earthly kingdom. But this verse plainly teaches that there will be an earth to come and that Christ will rule with the iron scepter and that we are co-heirs with Christ and we will rule too. He's not talking about the present earth because he will destroy this earth with fire because it's going to be and has to be significant changes according to Zechariah chapter 14 verses 9 through 11. There will be significant, significant changes in this world. And I believe there are many signs, in fact, to indicate that the change is near. I believe it's near. Just my own perspective. But this isn't really the issue here. The issue, the point being made here in verse 5 is simply that the new world will not be ruled by angels, but by man. The new world will not be ruled by angels. So to get the whole issue in perspective, let me tell you why this is important and why the author was writing it. We should understand that this present world or our present inhabited world, earth, right now is ruled by angels. The chief angel, Satan, who fell from grace, right? He is called the prince of the earth, the prince of the world, right? Satan. Jesus himself said in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. The ruler of this world be cast out. 
You see, in Christ, he no longer has dominion over you. He has no more power over you. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are free and you are righteous because of what Jesus has done for you. But make no mistake, Satan is still at work in this world and he is still the prince of this world. Jesus also said in John 14, 30, I will no longer talk much with you for the rulers of this world is coming. For the ruler of this world, who's that Satan, is coming. He has no claim on me. The last book I preached through was what? Ephesians, right? And we learned from the book of Ephesians that this world is under tremendous demonic influence. Demons are fallen angels, and they are called rulers. They are rulers in this world. Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If you don't believe that we're at war, that we are in a spiritual battle, turn on the news. Pay attention to what's going on in our own culture and multiply that by the world. It's not just here, it is everywhere. Marriages are falling apart. People are turning on each other. We are entering into a cultural war. Why? Because Satan is the prince of this world. And there's a real battle going on. And we need to be prepared. We need to put on the full armor every day. You've got to take up the breastplate of righteousness, but you've also got the shield of faith. I mean, when he's shooting his arrows at you without the shield of faith, if you don't learn to walk by faith, you cannot protect yourself. I don't care how good you are with the word of God, which is your sword. If people are shooting arrows at you and you're just trying to knock them out of the air, you're going to get stuck. You need the shield of faith. We need to walk by faith. And then we need to use the word of God against the enemy. It's our only weapon of attack. It's not about what you think. It's not about what you believe. It's about what the Word of God says. That's why we have to understand the Word in context. We need to know what it says and why we need to apply it to our lives. It's critical for us. Critical. So there's a real battle going on. But God never intended for the angels to rule this world. Man was given that claim. Man was created to be the ruler over the earth. He was meant to rule over it. And in God's final plan, in God's final destiny, one day we will, man will rule over this earth and the angels will will serve us because we are co-heirs with Christ, created to reign and rule. Why? That, that, That is the million dollar question. Why? Why would God choose us? Because of his love for us. Because his love for us is so deep, so great, so wide, that it's hard for us to truly conceive. I mean, sometimes it's hard for people to even love themselves. It's hard for people to believe that other people love them. Much less the creator of all the universe. But he does. Beyond what we can often comprehend. The author says it has been testified Somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So the writer's saying it has been testified somewhere. Please do not mistake this for ignorance. The author is not ignorant of where this came from. He is not forgetful of the scriptures. He quoted it perfectly. It is perfect. How could he not know where the passage was and quote it perfectly? He quotes it from the Septuagint, which is the Greek copy 
of the Old Testament. It's the version of the Old Testament in the Greek. It was translated from the Old Testament in Hebrew and Aramaic to the Septuagint when the Greeks conquered the known world. They wanted to have one language which prepared the way for Christ. So they had what we call Koine Greek. So the world took everything that was written in a different language and translated it into Greek, including the Old Testament. So when the author writes to these Jewish believers, he is quoting often from the Septuagint. And he quotes it perfectly. This is Psalm 8. And every author, I mean every Jewish believer recipient knew that David is the author of Psalm 8. And he quoted it perfectly. But throughout this book, and this is important to note, Throughout the book of Hebrews, no human author is mentioned by name. Not one time. Not one time is a human author mentioned by name. The writer is so concerned with the Jew Jewish readers understanding who really wrote the Old Testament that he doesn't want to ascribe any of it but to God. He doesn't want any human author to get any credit. He wants them all to understand that God inspired the word. The voice of the Holy Spirit is what matters. And he's so concerned with that that he doesn't bring up the human author. They're only incidental, right? They're the vehicle. But God is the divine author of all scriptures. And you, you need to know that too. The word of God, the word of God is inerrant. It's complete, it's whole. It's infallible. And so what we think, hear me, doesn't really matter. What we think needs to be biblical. Everybody says, I believe God's like this. I think God's like this. It doesn't matter what I, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what I think. I tell myself that all the time. Scott, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God's word says. It doesn't matter what I believe or what I feel. It matters what God's word says because that is the final authority. You can't put what you feel above God's word. You can't put your thoughts above God's word. You've got to come to the foundation of God's truth because God's truth is truth. It's the only truth. And you've got to measure what you think against God's word. And if what you think is out of line, then you better get it in line. Because God's word is truth. And that truth does what? It sets you free. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciple. Right? John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth. You will experience it. And the truth will set you free. And then two verses later, whoever the son sets free. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. Whoever the son sets free will be free indeed. So we have to line our thoughts up with the word of God. That's why I beg you to be in the word. I urge you to study the word. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, right? And be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You've got to take the word of God and your mind has to be washed every day. So I want to challenge you right here, right now. I know a lot of you spend a lot of time on social media or looking at your phone. So I'm going to ask you just for a week, try this. Try this for a week. All the time that you would be looking at social media, replace it with the Word of God. Spend that time reading God's Word, meditating on God's Word. Blessed is the man, right? Psalm 1, that meditates on his Word day and night. Because you're looking at your phone day and night. I got a text message at 2 a.m. last night in the morning. That's right, 2 a.m. Because people were looking at their phone. Listen, replace the time that you spend on social media or looking, just try it for a week with the word of God and let that be life to you. Let it be breath. David said, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word, right? Psalm 119, verse 9, verse 11, he says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right, and then in that same story, he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It light, lights the way, it directs me, it gives me insight and knowledge. It shows me how to live. We need the word of God to wash away all the garbage that we pick up from social media, all the influences from the culture. We need his word. And you can never get too much of the word. Never. So I'm imploring you. 
to spend some time this week in the Word. That God, I mean, might really renew your mind. That your thoughts might be measured by the Word of God and not by what you feel or what society says or what everybody on Facebook thinks. But by what God says and what He says alone. You know, God has created us to rule. Why? Because He loves us. Because he truly, genuinely loves us. The quotes here that he gives from Psalm 8 refer to mankind, not the Messiah. A lot of people say, yeah, he starts off with mankind. And he says, you know, what is man that you might be mindful of him? But the son of man. Now the son of man here from the Old Testament isn't talking about the Messiah. The son of man is a reference to mankind in the Old Testament. Ezekiel is called over and over and over the son of man. He's called the Son of Man. It's a reference to mankind. He doesn't talk about the Messiah until verse 9. And we'll see that next week. But right now he's focused on mankind. And the writer beautifully makes his point by using the Old Testament, knowing that his recipients will fully comprehend what he's talking about when he quotes from Psalm 8. And throughout the whole book of Hebrews, you see these constant quotes from the Old Testament. What makes it hard, that's what makes it hard for New Testament believers like you and I to really grasp the Old Testament because you weren't raised in it. You don't fully understand it. You haven't memorized it by the time you were 12. So it makes it a lot more difficult for us to really grasp it, even when we read books like this. But that's why we have to study, to understand the context. What is the author saying and why? I mean, David wrote this, and he did a beautiful job of using this because he was asking the same question. He was like, what is man? What have we done? Why are you so mindful of us? What is man that you have done so much for me? I mean, don't you ask that? Don't you ever say, God, why? Why would you die to save a wretch like me? Man, I ask that all the time. Because I know that I am wretched, that I am unrighteous, that apart from Christ, I am dead in my sin. I can say what Paul said in Romans 7, 18, there's nothing good that lives within my sinful nature. While Paul struggled, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. What a wretched man I am. That's what he says at the end of chapter 7. Who will rescue me from this body of death? But then I concur with chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son in likeness of sinful man. Aren't you glad? Why did he do that? Because he loves us. And it's not because you're special or intelligent or bright or good looking or beautiful. It's because of who he is. He's love. It has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with him. David cries out, what is man that you've done so much for me? I mean, when you think about it, just, just for a moment, think about the vastness of the universe, the amazing complexity of the planets, the galaxies. I mean, how large and beyond comprehension it really is. And to think about this little dot, this little thing we call the earth. I mean, it's just a speck in light of the whole universe. Universes, galaxies, just a dot. And, and when you think about that, just this little dot, you too have to say, why would God care so much about us? I mean, it's just a dot. What is man? What right do I have to be so much on the mind of God? The mind, God, I'm on his mind. You were, before the foundation were, you were on his mind. Ephesians 1, 4, right? He chose you before the foundation of the world. What am I that I would be so much on the mind? What are you that you would be so much on the mind of God? I mean, David is struggling with that question as the psalmist. What are we that you would be mindful of us? But then he answers his own question. He says, you made him man for a little while. This is temporary. 
lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Look, he has crowned you with glory and honor. He has crowned you with glory. What? Do you deserve glory and honor? No, you deserve death. Eternal separation from God because you are sinful, rebellious by nature. But he saved us. And he has crowned us with glory and honor. One day we will rule. Look at it. Everything in subjection under his feet. One day everything will be in subjection under our feet. I mean, to me, this is amazing. God made him man to be king of the earth. And that's our destiny. That is our destiny. No doubt both David and the author of Hebrews were both thinking about Genesis 1 as they penned these words. Because Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, mankind, have dominion. What does dominion mean? To rule, to have all authority. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the er, over all dominion rulership over all the earth and even over every creep that creeps i mean every creeping thing that creeps on the earth which means the creeps too that we have dominion man was created to rule and to reign not the angels over all the earth. But man forfeited that in Genesis 3 when the fall took place, and we'll see that next week. Uh, the rest of this passage leads into the fall and how we lost it and how we can recover it. And this is part one on recovering the crown because we need to understand where we are and what our need is because we were created to reign and to rule. He went on in verse 27 and 28, and he says, So God created man in his own image. We are image bearers. Look, listen to me. I don't care if you're white, yellow, black, brown. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. We are image bearers of God. Amen. Every one of us. And there's no preference there's no distinctions. There's one race, the human race. And we need to understand as believers, we're not Jew and Gentile. There's no division. We are all one in Christ. Anybody who is in Christ, we are all in Christ together. We are all in Christ together. We're not distinguished, separated. I mean, that was Jesus' prayer in John 17. Father, make them one as you and I are one. But we're living in scary times where evangelicals are pulling each other apart, fighting over this woke Christianity. There's this woke movement. There's all kinds of issues in the evangelical church where people are falling away from sound doctrine, letting their ears be tickled. And we need to beware. We need to be in the Word so that we know the, the false stuff when it comes at us to distinguish it between the truth. God created man to rule. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. It's yours. Control it. Take it. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We were created for greatness. That's right. And through Christ, through Christ, you have the power to walk in Christ-likeness. You can't do it apart from Christ. 
And that's why the crucified life You know, Jesus kept using that statement. If you read the book of Luke, you see Jesus saying over and over, if anyone would come after me, then he gave a prerequisite. If anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross, which is the signature of death. Take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. So there's this whole aspect of dying that has to take place in order to live. You have to die first in order to live. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I am dead with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by what? Feelings? No, by faith through the Son of God who loved me. and gave. I live by faith. The righteous, Romans 1.17, shall live by faith. If we're ever going to be Christ to the world, you can't do it by living according to your feelings or your own thoughts. You have to live by faith. You got to walk in faith. You got to die. And God is shaping us for that. I mean, that's why He allowed marriage, right? Marriage is like daily suicide. It it is. I mean, you got to die daily. If you're married, you understand in order to be a good wife, in order to be a good husband, you have to die to yourself daily. It's the greatest gift. It really is. Because it teaches us what it means to live a crucified life. And that's what God has called us to. To live this life that honors him and so that we get out of the way and we live by faith. And then Christ, the hope of glory, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory, is shining through us so the world can see Christ. So temporarily right now, we were meant to rule, but we lost our rulership. So the angels are ruling. Satan is the prince of this world. But one day that will be renewed and restored. So in the meantime, we have to rest in our identity. We have to rest in who we are. Now I want to give you a verse that I'm, I want to ask you to meditate on this week, all right? 1 John 3, 1 and 2. I want you to meditate on this verse this week. It's critical. Critical for your well-being, for your understanding of what your identity is. See what kind of love the Father has given to. Now, there's different translations. Some say lavish. See what kind of love the Father's lavished on. Some say poured out. Because the picture here is God just overwhelming us with his love. God is overwhelming us with his love. Just pouring it out all more than we can even understand. See how great the Father's love is. See what kind of love the Father has given given to us that we should, that you and I should be called children of God. That's what we are. So we are. Think about that. You're dead in your sin, and yet God makes you alive. He not only gives you life, he makes you his child. He not only makes you his child, he gives you this identity. He justifies you so that when he sees you, he sees you as holy and righteous, blameless before his sight. Not only does he see you that way, he sanctifies you so that you begin to live that way. He is in the process of sanctifying us that we might become more like Christ. He's using every circumstance, every situation, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So he's working all these things together that you might become, verse 29, like Christ. He is working them. Why? Why? The million-dollar question. Because of his love for you. Think about that love. His love for you that he has lavished, that he has poured out. It makes you who you are. You are who you are because of your understanding of his love. So then he says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Listen to me. Stop trying to make everybody understand you. If somebody is lost and dead, they're not going to understand you. Stop getting into debates with them. Stop arguing. They don't. No, Jesus, they won't know you. That's simple. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to know you because they didn't know Christ. We are a strange people. This is not our home. We are just passing through. Your life is but a vapor, right, that appears for a little while, then it's gone. We're just on a journey, aliens and strangers in this land. And our job while we're here is to represent him, to be a witness for him. To let his light shine. 
That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine that they might see your good deeds. Not your arguments, not your debates, not your thoughts, not what you feel. That's not what it's about. It's about letting that light shine that they might see Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then he says, beloved, we are God's children. Reemphasizing it. Verse 2, now and what we will be, this is our hope. This is where we need to rest. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know, it's full conviction, that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. One day we're going to be just like Jesus. And we will be co-heirs to the crown. But while we're here, he gave us his word to teach us, to guide us. He gave us his spirit that we might be surrendered and yielded to the Spirit of God. Not grieving, not quenching, but led. That's what it means to be Spirit-led. So that He is leading us and guiding through our daily decisions, through our conversations, constantly in communion with Him. That's what Jesus meant in John 15 when He said, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you, and you'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to be in His presence daily, moment by moment, so that He might be speaking to us and through us that the world might see Christ. But if you don't rest in that love, you're going to live with anxiety. You're going to live with doubt. You're going to struggle with panic and fear because you're not resting in his love. Because if he loves you, if you know that, then you can rest in that. Then you know he's got everything. And that even if you died tomorrow, you've got nothing to lose and nothing to fear. Nothing. Because you're going to be with him. I mean, can you imagine that thought? I mean, I think about that all the time. I can't wait for me to close my eyes for the last time on this earth and open my eyes to his face. When I die and take my last breath and my heart beats this last beat, I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to see Jesus face to face. Man, because he loves me. Not because I feel like he loves me, not because I think he loves me, but because his word says he loves me. And so my faith isn't based on what I feel. It's based on what he says. It's based on the character and content of God. Can't base it on what you are because we're not holy in, a, in and of ourselves. But in Christ, we are holy and righteous because of what he's done for us. So one last point here, and then I'll close. I know you're getting hungry. You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned him. Now, here's the key. Crowned him. What does the king wear? That's why he's illustrating this. He's talking about mankind. Listen, you're meant to be a king. You should be the king of your home. You should be the king of your family. We should be kings. Giants among grasshoppers. As believers, our love for Christ to be so powerful, so overwhelming that people see the holiness of God in us. They see the righteousness of Christ oozing out of our pores. We should be taking the gospel to all of our friends and all of our family members and all of our neighbors and our coworkers because that's the only hope for the lost and dying world is Jesus. And you've got to die to yourself so that you don't give in to the temptations of the devil because Satan, man, he's a liar. And he's also a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's waiting for you to live in unbelief. So we can pounce on you. To live in doubt. Because when you doubt the goodness of God, when you doubt the love of God, when you doubt the sovereignty of God, you are open prey. You've got to believe. You've got to walk by faith. Because in one moment of weakness, your whole life can be ruined. Just like that. I've seen it from pastors. I've seen it from friends. I've seen it from many people. Then in one moment of unbelief, we give our lives away. Give our lives away. So here's your memory verse. Meditate on this verse all week this week, all right? I want you to grasp this. I want you to take it home. I want you to think about it. I want you to write it down. Put it on a three by five card. Carry it with you. Hebrews 3.12. Take care, brothers. Now, who's he writing to? Believers. Take care, brothers lest there be in any of you, the believers, evil, 
You say, wait a minute, these are believers. How can they be evil? Yeah, that's right. I'm evil. Man, I can be as evil as they come. That's a fact. I am wicked. I am unrighteous. And there go I, but the grace of God. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. What is evil? To doubt God. It's evil to doubt God. When you live with worry and fear and anxiety, you are doubting God. You are not trusting him. You're not leaning on him. You're not looking to him. It's evil. Because we are called to live by faith. It's not just something you struggle with. It is evil. Not because I say so. Because the word of God says so. An evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. God made him, 2 Corinthians, right? 5.21, God made him to be sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God to reconcile us. So here, God did everything to draw us close. And when we choose to walk in unbelief, we fall away. God did it all to bring us in, but then we walk away, we turn away. It's like a slap in the face. And so I'm urging you to live by faith, to meditate on his word, to renew your mind that God might be glorified in you. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Father, have your way in our lives. Be exalted and lifted up, God. Change us from the inside out that we might become more like Jesus. God, thank you for your word. Teach us, Father, to apply it to our lives that we might shine in a dark and dying world. For your glory, Father, and for your namesake, in Jesus' name, amen.